Is math invented or discovered? I recently asked you all in a poll here on YouTube and the top line result is about two thirds of you went for the discovered camp and one third for the invented camp. However, I know there's a lot of nuance to this question so feel free to leave your full thoughts down in the comments. But in this video, I wanted to unpack the question a little bit, share some of my perspectives on math and hopefully show you some cool math along the way. This video is sponsored by FlexiSpot, which is the makers of my new office chair. More about them later in the video. Now, both words invented and discovered don't have like a tight mathematical definition. And so it's a little bit unclear like what a satisfactory answer to this question even really could be. However, both words do have a lot of connotations in our society. The word discovered gets used in news articles like this one, where possibly the largest species of snake ever has been discovered in the Amazon basin. Now it's estimated this species has been there for 10 million years. The local Walrani indigenous people were aware of its existence, but the international science community wasn't aware that it was a separate species from other anacondas. So discover has this bit of an implication of something that existed beforehand that we're only finding out about it now. In contrast with invented, well you might invent a new game like say chess or I love this article, the AI in the future might invent other AIs. In these cases, the game of chess and the AI didn't exist beforehand. There's something new in the universe that's being created or invented. But with invention there's also this connotation that there's lots of like choices, many of them perhaps quite arbitrary, that are part of what's being developed. Like for my iPhone here, Apple invented this iPhone, but there's you know huge numbers of possible choices that could be made to go in this iPhone. It's not like a fundamental property of the universe that the iPhone had to be exactly like this. This is an invention, not a discovery. Okay, so how might this work in the context of math? Recognizing that math has many parts, there's theorems, there's proofs, there's definitions, there's axioms, so maybe your answer isn't the same for all of those. Let's take first basic facts, like that there's infinitely many prime numbers. This fact was discovered, to use the word, by the ancient Greeks, in the sense that at least as far as we can tell, humanity wasn't aware of it beforehand, but that doesn't mean there wasn't infinitely many primes before humanity was aware of it. It was just that we hadn't yet discovered them. And I tend to feel in an example like that one, which is quite fundamental, that there's not this huge body of arbitrary choices that we've made along the way. I mean, we've chosen to study prime numbers, but if an alien civilization was interested in prime numbers, that they were also equally advanced, you'd imagine that they would get to that same basic fact. But Euclid went further, he proved this theorem, and there's actually an enormous number of proofs. And, and one argument I've heard before is, well, maybe the proofs are more like inventions as opposed to discoveries. That, that's a possible answer. But in a sense, that proof, the validity of this proof, the validity that that proof demonstrates that there's infinitely many primes, is itself a mathematical fact, much like that there's infinitely many primes as well. However, not all theorems and certainly not all proofs are as simple and foundational and core to mathematics as the ones I've just described. So let's put a pin in this, even though I've sort of argued a bit on the discovery camp, and come back to this a little bit later. Because now I want to talk about axioms. Now before we go on, I wanted to share that for the last couple of years I have been using this really crappy office chair. I thought it was good when I bought it, but as you can see it is just falling apart and I could never really adjust it to be very comfortable. So I've been on the hunt for a high quality office chair that is willing to sponsor a lowly math YouTuber like myself, and FlexiSpot is it. So this is my new FlexiSpot C7 office chair, and I actually really love it. Its seats are made out of either foam or mesh, none of that vinyl nonsense, but what I really liked about it was just how adjustable it is. I mean, check out this thing, you could do all sorts of craziness, it's a little bit insane. The part that I find most important is the lumbar support, which you could adjust all aspects of the lumbar support, and, and, and really it is everything. Like even here you can see on the headrest, you can move it up or down, 
you can invent it, whatever you like. I mean, I'm 6'2", this chair will go up to 6'9 and 300 pounds. I can just lean back and relax and think about bad math philosophy like I've been doing in this video. It's fantastic. So they have a 30-day risk-free return policy, a 10-year warranty, and this specific chair is the C7, and you can get 50 bucks off by using the code C750. Click the link down in the description. All right, back to the video. One of the most liked comments on the survey was that perhaps the axioms are invented. These maybe are not true properties of the universe, they're things that we choose to either accept or reject. But that the properties that follow from the axioms, those are discovered. In math, we build this whole hierarchy of mathematics on top of sets of axioms at the bottom. And there's many choices in how you do this. You could come up with any axiomatic system. Most of them are just sort of really stupid and pointless, but you could come up with sort of any number of bizarre axiomatic systems and then try to prove theorems within them. It's a little bit like a game, like chess. Like the axioms could be the rules of chess. You could invent any number of games. There's just infinitely many games. Probably most of them are terrible games. But then you could see, given those rules, what properties come from them. But in mathematics, we don't just accept any axioms. Like, for example, we're really interested in axioms that at least include arithmetic. So the, the normal manipulations on natural numbers that we do, that you can do those in whatever your axiomatic system is. Otherwise, a little bit like, why would you care? So we have commonly accepted axiomatic systems like zermelo frankel set theory. But, but even there, there's debates. Do you include the axiom of choice? Do you not include the axiom of choice? The axiomatic foundations of mathematics are, are not completely rigid. And while I would imagine going back to that alien civilization that was, you know, relatively advanced, I'd imagine that they'd know things that like 1 plus 2 is 2 plus 1, but they wouldn't necessarily use the same axiomatic foundation that we do. Maybe they don't even use axiomatic foundations at all. I mean, that would be really fascinating. Ultimately, we're a set of axioms. I mean, I, I can't prove to you that they're correct or not. I can perhaps argue that they're useful at describing some aspect of our universe and maybe you accept them or don't. But then are all the discoveries that follow from axioms, well, discoveries to, to steal the word? Like take that game of chess again. I, I like to think of the rules of chess as being something that humans uh, invented. We didn't really discover them. It seems slightly strange to put it that way. But within the rules of chess, like for example, there's something called a table base of n games, and the computer will tell you for every possible position, with seven pieces or less, whether it's a win, a loss, or a draw with perfect play. It's just being computed out entirely by the computer. So that's sort of like a theorem, and maybe you could think of it as a discovery within this axiomatic system, but it's a theorem in a game that we invented. See, the language isn't quite as straightforward as you might hope that it would be. Now, the choices that we make, though, go much further than just the axioms, and it comes to the definitions. In mathematics, we spend a lot of effort being really, really precise and specific with our definitions so we know exactly what mathematical objects we're referring to. So, for example, we might study functions in general, but then we get more specific and study continuous functions, and more specific and study differentiable functions, and more specific and study smooth functions. And there's results, like for second differentiable functions, there's a second derivative test that doesn't apply when you don't have that nice property. So we build these hierarchies of definitions on top of definitions on top of definitions, and we're doing so because of good reason. We want to focus on these specific objects, but there's choices about how we define things, what objects we should or should not care about. In contrast with making things more and more specific, in math we also like to generalize and abstract so we like to think, well, I might have started with some setting from physics, but, but can I actually generalize this to a broader context? So for example, you might have differentiable functions on the real line, and then you generalize differentiable functions in higher dimensional space, and then you talk about differential functions on manifolds. There's all sorts of stuff that you can keep on generalizing to larger contexts. And what really, really often happens in mathematics is that these two different things, the tendency sort of to generalize and the tendency to make things more specific, that they both go on in parallel. We generalize and then we sort of get a bit more specific in some way and we generalize that and get a bit more specific and you keep on building this hierarchy. And so you might be in a very weird abstract context and setting far removed from sort of the original basis, but now we'll be talking about a really specific object in that larger setting. There's some level of invention, I think, to the rules of the game. So my point here is that 
even if you want to call any specific discovery a discovery, I think that's very natural to do it. That, that's what I do as well. Uh, you know, if I'm playing around with something, I'll say I discover a particular pattern. That, that's the nomenclature I do. But there still is a sense within all of these hierarchies of concepts and definitions that you're doing these discoveries within the rules of a game that you've invented. Personally, I feel like my PhD had some vibes of this. Firstly, in mathematics we often refer to some types of math as being tools. So uh, my background is something called algebraic topology, and there was a lot of tools in algebraic topology, a tool that you might use in many other places to try and solve problems. It's like a useful thing that you can go and do in all these different contexts. So we call that a tool. And tools often get the word invented beside them, don't they, right? Like we invented the wheel, we invented the microscope, we invented equivariant k-theory, perhaps, a tool within mathematics. And then the tools that these problems were applied to were within a specific branch of mathematics called symplectic geometry. Now, symplectic geometry is really interesting because it came out of physics. It was sort of a, a mathematical framework to try to understand problems in classical mechanics. One of the sort of standard first examples, you know, you get words like momentum in your mathematical definitions. And, and then symplectic geometry turned out to be useful in lots of places in physics, even useful in things like string theory. But mathematicians now study symplectic geometry as its own field. I should probably do a whole video on this at some point. Uh, but, but it's this field in its own right, and mathematicians ask all sorts of mathematical questions that are sort of far beyond the level of like, does this immediately go and help us with some physics problem? There's just layers upon layers of extraction built into the, to the beautiful field of mathematics that this is. So there's a, a certain level of not exactly arbitrariness, that's not quite the word, but a certain level of choice that gets to be made in, in what things humans are really going to define and focus their attention on. And a lot of these choices are actually made socially. Like if you're applying for a grant or trying to publish a paper, certain areas of mathematics, they have more importance because of their connection to other areas, the, the sense within the community that the problem is particularly deep or not deep. There's sort of a, a community-based idea of, of what the sort of the focuses of humanity's efforts in mathematics ought to be. But again, they're, they're human reasons, and, and the advanced alien society well, maybe their interests in mathematics are going to be very, very, very different. And so even if, if both societies agreed on there being infinitely many prime numbers, it seems to me that the hierarchies and edifices that would be built up would be really, really different between the two. Ultimately, do we think this matters? No, I don't. I mean, I think this is a fun little question to think about and to explore mathematics on. Actually, I think it's more asked by, by non-mathematicians, and if you're just a research mathematician, you're probably not thinking about this too much. I would say most research mathematicians are going to feel like they're making a discovery, they get their big aha moment, it feels like you discovered something. But, uh, but there's elements of both, and I can understand why the survey is split both ways. But, but what do you think? I mean, that's the most important part. So whatever you think, please do leave it in the comments below. Final reminder that if you do want to check out this C7's chair by FlexiSpot, you can get an additional 50 bucks off your order by using the code C750. The link is down in the description. FlexiSpot has all sorts of chairs and tables. They're a great company. I encourage you to check them out. With that said and done, I hope you enjoyed the video, and we'll do some more math in the next video.